Hello, my name is Patricia Rozvora and you're listening to Kitchen Conversations. This podcast aims to open up the mysterious and vague Eastern Bloc to a broader audience. For each episode, I'm inviting one artist or researcher and together we explore the relation, interest and the urgency to create within the framework of the post-Soviet sphere. Here, I also wanted to thank everyone for listening and supporting this podcast. It's very rewarding to see that with every episode, the community is growing, which was, of course, the whole point of this platform. If you are a regular listener, you might want to check out my Patreon page, where you can support my work and help me develop this amazing but time-consuming project. You can do that on patreon.com slash kitchenconversations. Welcome back, everyone. Happy New Year. Hope you are having a good beginning of 2022. Uh, today, uh, I invited for a conversation Kai Herman, who is running the Ost Gays podcast, which focuses on queer Eastern European perspectives from and in Germany. Kai holds a BA degree in popular music and media and is currently working on his master degree in gender studies. Since 2017, Kai has been working as a freelance publicist with a focus on independent film and film festivals, including a Romani film festival Akedik Hea, Lithuanian film festival Elte Kino Goes Berlin or Expose Queer Film Festival. In addition, he also works as a content creator and strategist for social media campaigns to present single films or film-related campaigns at international festivals such as Berlinale, CPH Docs, Cannes, ITFA or the International Film Festival Rotterdam. Uh, just a little note that this episode was recorded back in December. So in the end of this um, conversation, you're going to uh, hear a little bit of a Christmas content. I hope uh, you don't mind. Yeah, a big shout out to Kai Herman and let's begin. <music> Welcome, Kai, to Kitchen Conversations. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Very happy to have you here. I'm following your work since I actually came to Berlin. Found out about it uh, through Ostraum, mm. through the article where they wrote about seven podcasts from uh, the post-Ost. Yeah, you were one of them because you are a podcaster. Mm -hmm. A very uh, great one, I think, so... Yeah, happy to have you here. Also, don't judge me for making my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, absolutely not. It looks uh, way more professional than at my place. So um, <laughs> have a good feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, before we start talking about you, your work, uh, your podcast as well, because I think this will be like the main part of, of our talk today. Uh, I would like you to, to say a little bit about this term post-Ost for the non-German speakers. I think it's a term which is very much used uh, within our like people, the Eastern European uh, souls, which kind of try to unravel this region. It's a term that I'm hearing all the time, everywhere, <laughs> and I think you, you also use it in your podcast. So just like, I think today we will use it more. So yeah, if you can tell what it is and why you're interested in this. Um, I will do it as good as I can because I also learned it just this year when I started with the podcast. Um, it wasn't even my intention to use it in the first place, but I got invited very quickly and very very warmly from the Postos community here in Germany to um, to be a part of them. And they invited me into this great bubble, um, which I think is amazing and I'm very thankful for. So basically Postos is like, is like a term which is used by people here in Germany who have historic um, connection to the Eastern part of Europe. Mostly, I would say, it's, it's something that I learned that it's very connotated with Russia and also with the former um, post-Soviet bloc there, but of course also like um, like in my case, uh, Polish 
um, or people with Polish um, ancestry or history use it more and more. So this is how I found out about it. It's I think it's still quite new and the definition is still like developing. And just, that's an interesting fact uh, for my podcast, which I started because um, the focus was general in in big on Eastern Europe. That was some, somehow of my perspective I wanted to, to get like this Eastern Europe vibe because I always felt kind of a connection throughout my history with Russian people, for example, or Czech people because of this Eastern connection, I guess. But uh, yes, I use it. I'm still learning a lot. There are great people in this discourse and in this community which are doing great work, like trying to find meaning for it and and developing this meaning but basically i think it's this it's like this you know this migrant background from from eastern europe you have in a broader sense and there was always like also a very interesting podcast episode i think it was the barbecue podcast here in germany the black brown queer podcast where um they talked about also about post ost and it was about which i found very enriching if, if someone comes for example from serbia like my second guest Amata from the podcast i would also of course allow her to claim this this um, definition for herself or this this term of post ost i think we should not reduce it to just a few countries but make it available for people who want to be a part of it so that's basically it i hope yeah what i like about it that it's so I guess in English we would use Eastern Europe or post-Soviet or something like that, but all of them are more like geographically Absolutely. connected. And this one has more like a socio-political connotation, I would think. It's in development. I think that this is the this is the important thing that it's still like in development. It's not a fixed term, maybe for some people, but I at least those people who I'm I talk to um, are working on this on this broader meaning it's a self-description and i think this is important po i think post-soviet is like you said very geographically and post-ost is maybe a bit more broader and that's why uh where i was lucky i have to be honest when i got to know this term i was like oh okay so my podcast actually fits into it but i can also go a bit a bit more broader and not just focus on the former ost block but also go maybe a bit more into the south, you know, like where Serbia or something is, yeah, yeah, which yeah, I think yeah. super, is super interesting. Why should I reduce um, reduce voices when I met people who are coming from different states of, of, of Eastern Europe and they have all great stories to tell? And still there's a lot of shared things, maybe like the culture is different, the languages are different, but there is shared and this is actually a point where I'm also a bit critical because of the background. I mean, I... I started to ask myself, why do I feel this connection to R Russian speaking people, to Czech people, you know, to general people from the East? And it's because I grew up here in Germany. And from this Western point of view, some people don't even know the difference between Czech or Poland. I, I met those people, you know, and I think this came kind of from this connections that all the time when I met people from Eastern European countries, I felt a vibe between us. There was something maybe it was something about food some something about culture uh, the our critical point of view of um maybe uh, traditions in eastern europe which created like a bond and that is what i'm also exploring in my podcast <laughs> from the queer perspective i would like to to make this point that i'm doing this queer perspective as well which is the center of it this is very important perspective on your podcast yeah. indeed and we will of course speak about it but firstly yeah i would like to speak also about you and how you found yourself in this world <laughs> you were born in germany correct mm -hmm. yes and your parents uh, migrated from poland to germany in the 90s yes and how was it back then how did this happen mm -hmm. yeah tell us a little about that yeah it was Exactly in 1990, first big wave in the at the end of the 80s was over, and my parents do uh, are not part of this wave anymore. Like they are this spät Aussiedler. I don't have an uh, English term for it. It's like the late migrants somehow somehow like this. And my parents decided to to uh, go to Germany. I think kind after the um, the wall broke down here. And they wanted to escape communism, to, um, to be honest. I talked with my mother about it. They wanted to escape communism, but also, and that was kind of funny, she also told me, yeah, you can dramatize this story, but your father and I, we were very young and adventurous, and we wanted to go out and just get to know a new, a new country. 
and because uh, of the of the region region they were growing up, which is uh, Silesia, Schlesien, Schlonsk, to have it in all three um, languages. Beautiful. Now it's all Schlonsk, all Silesia, but there was like an upper and a down Silesia something, uh, Ober Unterschlesien, and Oberschlesien, where my family is from, my whole family is located there uh, in Poland, had a very interesting historical shift because it was part Czech, part old German or Polish. Polish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the history is very, very interesting. And I and my father told me once that because the family, my, my father's family stayed in Silesia all the time, uh, he had the rights to get faster papers to immigrate to Germany. I've always asking this question or a few times with my parents, with my grandmother from my father's side, what's it about with my surname? Because my surname is uh, is quite German. Quite German, yeah. And it was even, they even did it more German because we got a second N at the end of Hermann. Mm -hmm. um, just to make it sound more German, my father explained me like this, if when he came to Germany, they added an N to the Mann, so it sounds more German. Because uh -huh. the, my original surname is with one R and one N, which is kind of this old German. Like, it sounds German, but it's more Preussisch, mm -hmm. I would say. But um, when I talked to my grandma also about it, uh, she was also like, they don't have an explanation quite why it sounds so German. It just is. Where it came from yeah. originally. Kind yeah, of. because basically, the as far as she knows, um, the family from my father's side, the Hermans, were always located in Poland and on, on Polish territory, you know. But it's, but it's kind of a big part of my identity, to be honest, because... When I now talk to people who I get to know from this post community and they have quite more, I would say, non-German um, sounding names, kind of Eastern European names or some would even say like Slavic surnames, they had a lot more recognition for it, you know. I didn't. I, My brother and me, I have an older brother, we are, I think, one of the most German passing Polish people I've met in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> really like um i i remember from sc from school that it just it it was from from this point you know like a topic when people got to know my parents and they started to speak you know when they opened their mouth and they said words and there was an accent they were like oh they gave you away <laughs> yeah yeah oh you're not you're, you're not german and yeah so so that's uh, because you asked about identity and where i find myself in this this is very important and that here in germany from an outside perspective i always felt felt german you know for family and everything it was always like this bilingual thing and still polish but i know that my experience is way more different than from people who have some more eastern european surnames it's uh, just uh, now thinking about uh, the region uh, Shlonsk, Silesia. That actually the the dialect there is quite. Uh, I love it. Quite German, I would say. There's a lot yes. of like random German words, and also like the um, yeah, the kind of melody of the of the of the language is. And they understand many German words. I mean, they use some of them, like in a, in this dialect kind of way. They even say to to boots like Schuhe. For example, which which, which comes exactly. from sure, this is super interesting. Yet yeah, those those are kind of these interesting connections. But also interesting is when I'm in Poland and I speak Polish, and I would say that my Polish is quite good, not perfect, but quite good. Most of the people are getting that I have an accent, and they, for example, do not see me as Polish anymore. Then, so there comes like this identity crisis: like, who am I? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. Uh, who? Where is my home? Where is my place? Which is one of the basic questions from my podcast. And the fact that I'm queer <laughs> makes it all... Even complica more complicated. <laughs> more complicated, more of a mess, I would say. Because there, there are kind of differences between being queer in Germany and being queer in Poland, I would say massive right now throughout the last years, which has been shown. And those are the topics I try to explore not only with my story, but especially to listen to other people, because it's the most vital thing you can do to hear experiences from other people, to hear their story. And this connection we have throughout the conversation was so good until now. And I'm very grateful for every person who, was, who took the time, you know, to tell the story. When did those two identities, being queer and Polish, Eastern European, post-Ost, came together that you felt like you want to work with those things mm -hmm. and you felt the need to to make the podcast and all the other work you do? It's a very good question. Definitely 
when the crimes and the right system in Poland became more queerphobic. Definitely. I think it was the turning point. It started, I think, in like early 2019, I guess, it was the year when the, when when peace got more got more and more power which is the um the ruling party right now in Poland the right wing party in Poland and they started to target non heteronormative life in Poland in an extreme way with the of course with the catholic church because for those who don't know it but I think most people know it like the church has a still a big impact in Poland um yeah basically they are really like going together yes, hand in hand yes they're going together hand in hand it's crazy yeah. and this was kind of the moment when i went to poland because i remember that even uh, there were brands a polish brands store brands for example there's this super nice multimedia store i love in poland i won't do now ad advertising for it but it's <laughs> super amazing tell me later <laughs> yeah and they had like this rainbow campaign which was super awesome and you didn't did not see that that much in poland and it got much hate for it uh, but they had a super nice social media coordinator who And this person was really firing back to every bad comment. It was really fun, fun to, funny to, to, to watch this. And then they stopped. It was the last year in 2020. It wasn't anymore. There was no rainbow campaign. And the big question which I was asking myself is, okay, I'm living now in Berlin for a few years. I am kind of super free with my identity. Like I, you know, I walk hand in hand with my boyfriend outside I go to clubs, I go to bars, I have this queer circle around me and we are, you know, exploring so much of our identity and we are feeling kind of free in it. And when I go to Poland to visit my family, this identity is gone. I, I feel like I'm back in the closet when I was like in my teens. And that was the turning point when I was like, how much privilege is inside of this double identity of, me, of mine? Growing up in Germany, in kind of a still kind of a more liberal place for being queer, I I think. And then still being Polish, having this connection there. Important. I, I feel that this identity is also very important for you, right? Being Polish and really identifying with the language and the culture. It, it's part of my culture, you know. It's no, it's nothing like I could um, ignore because I love this country. This is this is the thing. I love Poland very much. I love Katowice, where my family is located. I love Warsaw, where I was living a few months. Um, it's it's a super nice country. It's a beautiful country, you know. And I also a keen with the people and everything and that's the struggle you know I, I i i for myself i couldn't ignore this difference and then i looked for ways how i can explore this more and i try to be because it's part of my person i try not to be very self-concentrated um and self-focused on on me and i found out that uh, of course during the pandemic last year i started to listen to more podcasts and i think this was the right medium to do it to just like we're doing now to talk, to exchange. And luckily it got super nice feedback. It was, I, I didn't expect this and it's still, you know, very small, but I'm doing this all by myself, you know, and it's a, like a passion project, but uh, it got this kind of love and acceptance from, from people, even outside of this post us community. Uh, so yeah, it's still a search. I didn't find any answer yet, but it's, um, but maybe I'm getting closer to it. Yeah. What I uh, really uh, appreciate and like about your podcast that you're giving platform to all those like amazing people who yeah create stuff and for example like Marta I followed um, her work so I really enjoyed also that you invited her and she was sharing uh, stuff about her movies also yeah. about her queer identity and her home as well uh, since I think how the media is portraying the things which are happening uh, in Poland and what comes to the West is like very one-sided. There is not much space for the actual people and their activism and all the amazing things they did for all these years of oppression and especially the recent years, which is really, really horrible what's happening. So I really, really appreciate that you're creating this. Pla I think we need more of these and Thank you. what also uh, I think our friends from X Dry podcast said the next step in the uh, post os podcast is like to create this very like specific post os podcast like from very specific perspective and I really really enjoyed that 
you you are leading the the queer perspective on thank on you so much yeah <laughs> but i have to be honest i'm not alone there there is um there is still the apostles pride podcast uh um from uh, fabio which is super amazing and it's and i think we, we haven't met each other by now but i think it's we both think it's kind of funny that we started this podcast at, at the same time yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's kind of nice that like and interesting that like two queer gay boys um, from Poland, Poland and Germany yeah. are doing this yeah. you know and there are now two podcasts who are exploring their identities and we have our own way he has his I have mine but um, it's I, th I think that's the important part you know I think uh, this we you know we are here and we have our identity and queerness is part of it if you want to and to explore this kind of thing is super interesting it's very honest very, very vulnerable as mm -hmm. well but because we are telling very personal stories so i i was super happy that each person which visited me by now was open for it and marta i can just give it back she's amazing i mean we met through work and she was open for it and she gave such great insights you know which you don't from a normal perspective in germany you don't get this infos on serbia and how people are living there you know um in belgrade like in her case and this is what these platforms are doing just inform people and giving access it's kind of nice I will, of course, post all the links. I was just talking about Marta's episode because it's in English and the rest for now is in German. So, yeah, the German speakers, of course, can enjoy. But you said uh, to me that you might use more episodes in English. In the oh, future, absolutely. So. It worked so good. It worked so good. And I also met, met a person through a friend who um, does not speak German, but I want to have his story on my podcast. So I think it works. Uh, I didn't get any complaints for it, in, in not at all. People were like more open to it because it's then more international available also. So yes, I, I w want to do it as a part of the podcast to do more English episodes. Yeah. I would like you to tell a little bit about the name of the podcast. It's called Ostgaze. My brother loved it for at first sight. He was like, it's such a great name. And I was like kind of unsure because I'm using this term or this expression of gay, which can be limiting because often it refers to simply gay men. But in a US context, and I'm very influenced by, by American ling language, um, it's used more universal, like even women or I'm, I think mostly women are, are also like using gay as a word or people in general. But the trick of it is that I'm mixing it up with the term gaze, which means like this having a view on something. You know, we, in feminist so, um, theory, we mostly know the term of uh, male gaze, female gaze. Mm -hmm. And this is something I mixed up with it and adding like the Y from gay to it. It's like this G-A-Y-Z-E uh, term. So it's kind of a mixed up, you know, it's like the Ost gaze. Of course, we have this queer term in it from gay, but it's gaze like look at us, like, this is our story, this is our point of view. Um, and I hope it works. I just tried it out, you know, I tried it out and I was like, ah, oh, I can go with it. And uh, funny story is that in, intentionally, I wanted to call the podcast uh, Polish Gaze because I wanted to focus on only Polish perspectives because I was afraid that I would, like, claim spaces I should not claim. But then I was like, quickly, no, I know at least a bunch of people who are from Eastern Europe, but not Polish. And I want to tell tell their stories through the podcast. So we switched to Ostgays and it worked kind of kind of funny, I guess. Yeah, yeah I really, really, I think it's a genius name. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, really like it. It's also like really stays once you hear it. It's it, easy. It stays, you know, yeah. It's easy and it's, uh, and I always value so much my, my brother's perspective because he doesn't come from a queer, um, from a queer lens. He learns through, also through the podcast and sometimes he, uh, we talk about queer theory because he's more and more interested in it and he was like, go for it. It's catchy. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> it Yay. was kind of nice. Uh, since I think that there was some, Yeah, how you may, made the name, I think I feel some um, academic also background. You mentioned like uh, in theory and the gays, uh, female, male gays and so on. Uh, I know that you are currently uh, doing uh, gender studies. Yes. Uh, yeah, can you, can you tell a little bit uh, about your experience? I got interested in it because for a few years now I was very interested in feminist discourse and queer discourse, for example, especially. And um, many of the theories are academic. 
like, like it always is. You know, theories are very academic and in this focused on this field of writing of literature. And at some point last year, the pop cultural texts I got and 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 read on it uh, weren't enough anymore. I was like curious about more more stuff and more literature and and then there was like maybe this more um gaze or, or something that I, I was like I wanted to have an intention with knowledge you know I, I was like okay I'm reading all this stuff and I have no purpose in it just it's just out of knowing it and I was like okay maybe I can start a, an, an MA again and do a master uh in in a field which could be in this in this direction feminist theory queer theory And uh, I found out about gender studies, which you can, I think, even study like at two or three universities here in Berlin. And I um, decided for one of them, uh, got in last semester, luckily. And it's tough. It's it's nice. It's super nice. It's uh, I love it. I'm I'm kind of even burning for it. I would say that, that's kind of nice. I wouldn't thought that I would be the person who could enjoy studying so much. But it's also kind of realistic you know it gives you a very harsh way of looking at the world as it is in our society because it's very truthful it's very critical and i re remember that you told me that you studied critical theory and we came across this that um for example before doing this today i had a course on reproductive rights and justice and every week after the first day session i'm kind of depressed for a few minutes because it's uh, because you just get to know more and more facts about how unfair and how patriarchal our society is you know but it's also the the kind of field where i'm feeling well where i'm feeling good at it because for me it's it's kind of interesting to see how structure works in our society i understand more about my place than as well about my identity uh where I, where i could come from i guess it's also like how you what you do with this knowledge and how you take it home you know and you, you know the term knowledge is power Mm -hmm. I like it, but I'm also critical about it because power is also force. It's a force, you know. It, yeah, it comes from... It comes yeah. from force. It comes from a urge to be powerful. But but it has truth to it. You know, when you have some kind of knowledge, you can also articulate yourself maybe better. And maybe this just comes now into my mind. I also wanted to be more um, sophisticated in my knowledge because... I have situations where I have to argue for my identity, you know, with some family members or something. And I wasn't that self-conscious enough for it. And this gives me kind of strength, I would say, you know. Although I know that there's a big difference between studying stuff like gender studies, like feminist theory, and doing really stuff on the streets outside, you know, in protests or something, which kind of gets mixed together also because this urge to protest and to be active in, in politics or social stances comes from from knowledge as well if you get to know how unfair the, the world can be and so i know my privilege you know as being here in berlin studying the gender studies and i'm still looking for ways where i can get a bit more active on another side as well yeah since a few years there's also a big discussion in poland again <laughs> another discussion going on about sexual education in schools the right-wing government and the church again want to like control it very much and basically decide what kids should learn and shouldn't yeah i'm curious what what is your uh, opinion about why is it important to give especially young people sexual education first of all i would be interested how popular the um, Netflix series Sex Education is in Poland. I think we have to dive into it and check how popular it is there because the discourses which are going on about it now in Poland. I watched it. <laughs> I love it. It's, it's super nice. Every person I know who watched it is just a super fan because because I think we can relate in our generation. Like my sex education even in, in German schools was very bad, like super bad. <laughs> So following Kai's proposal, I actually googled the British show Sex Education in relation to Poland. I didn't find specific numbers about how popular the show is. Uh, only some articles uh, from educators and psychologists that the show is definitely something the young people should watch because it's way more informative 
than uh, what Polish people get uh, taught in schools. Uh, but what's more, I found a very fun fact, and here watch out for the spoilers, that in episode 2, uh, season 1, when Maeve uh, goes to an abortion clinic, Otis, who at first goes with her, ends up in a Polish supermarket that is located just next to the clinic, looking for something to comfort his friend. And the critics uh, suggest that the placement of a Polish shop and Polish products precisely in the episode talking about abortion can be coincidental. Well, I also think there was some intention there, but I leave you the interpretation of this peculiar product placement and let's uh, continue with the conversation. <laughs> But to come back to your question, it's scary. It's kind of middle age vibes, which are super unhealthy. They really cut out other, I think, more social political matters in school and subjects to increase kind of this religious stand and to and kind of this hours of religious uh, classes, you know. And I'm always asking myself first, what are they afraid of? Those people are doing this, like they are, you know, that's because it's so easy to say it's because of their belief system, because of their Catholic Christian values. But for me, this answer is just kind of too easy because um, maybe maybe it's kind of naive to believe that I don't believe that people in general are stupid. Um, some people are, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> We have but, to say it. <laughs> yeah, but um, I'm always asking myself, what what is the goal of it? Like they preventing young people who are really from like a classical biological stand, yeah, are just interested in sex with growing age. You know, we've been there. We've, we've been through the space, you know, and they are preventing those people to get safe knowledge, to know for example, even about sexual diseases, you know, about health, sexual health, about unwanted pregnancies and everything, like all this stuff, you know, they're preventing young people to know these things, which are like the basic of life. And I can promise all those people in Poland who are like fighting for this rule, for more religious classes and less sex education, that those young people will still find ways to have sex if they want to. No, that's the, the thing. I mean, if you forbid drugs, it doesn't absolutely. mean that people will do less drugs. Absolutely. <laughs> and and this is kind of, you know, but on a, on another point of view, we still have to find some nuances and also be critical about sex education itself because even in Germany and I think in most countries, yeah, sex education is very binary and gender binary. So they are talking about, you know, um, bees and flowers and everything and about two genitals, for example, and they are not diving into more perspectives and more possibilities. So uh, this is also very important to know. Yeah. Of course, I would wish for Poland that they would cut off this This bullshit is this crap they are doing and just give those young people the education they need on sexual behavior, but they would still not get like the full coverage of it as we do it here in Germany. There are still very, very, very blank, many blank spots to it. Yeah. Mm. So we have to see always this two side of stories. The sex education has to be more inclusive, more queer, for example. We discussed while we had coffee that we're not gonna speak too much about all the horrible things which are happening and just speak more about the yeah the the activists who are actually changing stuff or like just people who are changing stuff like you and I hopefully <laughs> uh, but I'm very curious like why do you think there is this like yeah this tendencies or, yeah I don't know if you can yeah this this horrible behaviors coming from more Eastern European countries, all this anti-feminist, anti-queer movements happening in Poland, in Hungary, in Russia. Do you have any ideas why, from where are those trends or political behaviors coming from? Is it somehow connected to, to the history of uh, the post-Ost? Do you, is mm -hmm. it connected to, to, the, to the church, of course? Where do you... Are you thinking about it? Why is it, for example, like this there and not as extreme here in Germany? 
Because it's also not like, of course, good versus bad, but... Yeah, well, that is always kind of the story that media is selling, you know, like this black and white portrait of West and yeah, East. Yeah, indeed, of course. And from experience, I would still say I I am very critical when posters people are saying that we have to diminish this this black and white perspective, that we have to say, oh, yeah, Poland and Hungary and Russia is bad, but Germany and Spain and Italy are also bad. Maybe Spain not that much, but other Western countries, you know. And I'm always like, well, hold on a minute. In Germany, we have no LGBT-free zones. In Germany, I, I think there are just very, in recent years, very less cases, a few cases maybe, you know, where gay people were killed intentionally. And this is happening still in Chechnya. We have to talk about it. It's still happening there. Um, there is a shift. There is a difference between geographically starting maybe in Germany, more of the West side, and then go to the East. There is a difference and we have to talk about it because it's because it's real. But still, it's a false claim when Western media are portraying solely the Eastern part of Europe as this bad guy. Because it's not perfect here either, you know? It's better, but it's not perfect. Mm. On the other hand, I think you did a good point with historically, but I'm not a, a historian or something. I'm not that good at it, but... It has, I think, I think Dennis talked about it quite interesting, uh, interestingly in, in my latest episode. Uh, it has something to do with history, with values, with the power of church as well, with, but with politics, you know. And what I observe and which is very scary is that the more Western, Eastern countries, like for example, Poland or Czech as well, are kind of imitating a bit of Putin's political style. And this Russian style. And I want to make it clear that I don't want to put out Russia on a spot right now because I respect Russia so much for its history and for its art and it has it's a super interesting country. But we see that there is something going on there since a few years, you know, in Russia. And queer people are not safe there anymore in maybe just like in Moscow or maybe Petersburg, but that's it. And that's always the big question. Why, why was this happening? When, where was the shift in history that Western countries started to develop a more liberal point of view and the Eastern countries are, you know, ha still held a bit more back? I mean, I can all, only speak about Poland, where I just get this capitalistic shift of countries. Because when I, I was partly growing up also there, you know, each year, and I see how Poland shifted throughout the years when it comes to industry when it comes to capitalism and everything you know like they are imitating it it was like not an imitation of western capitalism but but somehow still there are people sometimes saying yeah some somehow eastern countries are still a few years backwards towards germany or something you know and i'm critical about this but it's still visible you know and when it comes to queer rights The steps we are doing in the West are also small. I mean, this gleichgeschlechtliche Ehe, yeah, like this marriage for everyone in Germany came through just a few years ago. It was super late, but it happened. And you can think about it uh, what you want, be a fan or not. But I think media are doing their part that the activism, the queer activism in Eastern Europe is getting very shut down. I think that people by now know if they're interested in uh, uh, in Bart uh, Staszewski, who is doing like great work for Poland. I mean, he even was part of the Obama Foundation. He's su super popular right now and he's having a strong voice and yeah. opinion. It's nice to, yeah. to mention. Yeah. But um, I, for example, I had to search for those people in Poland. I'm having still reading this magazine, Replika, uh, which is sent to me um, to my home here, here in Berlin um, each, I think each three months or something. And that was my biggest impact, you know, having a Polish medium from Polish people. And it's, believe me when I tell you, Patricia, then it's way more different than queer media in Germany. Because here what we have, the magazines are glossy and you know, most of them are glossy and they're having like fun and doing like, they are very sexualized, which is also kind of fun, but they are very entertaining. And The magazine I have from there, which is only this one, I think a second is now in development, but it's also kind of more artsy. But the replica, it's really on the point what's going on in Poland. They are talking to queer people about their lives, about their perspectives. And this is something I'm missing here in Germany. And even from the UK, and especially from the US. It's all about 
the fun aspect, the entertainment aspect, which queer people were dragged into from history. You know, we were dragged into being in the entertainment business, for example, and being the funny people because we didn't have a place in politics. And I see that the Polish queer activists are changing this narrative. They don't want to be the, the funny birds on TV. I think they want, they want to change something. And this is so inspiring to, to see and to listen. This, uh, yeah, really like gives me this thought that maybe there is, or not maybe, but there is like a big potential in all those, you know, since like the experiences are, yeah, being, as you said, like so controlled by media and so mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's so in the spotlight that, um, because I always thought that there must be something in those regions which has more potential than here somehow in the West, I would yeah. say. I don't know how to how to put it into words, but I had this suspicion since we lived through, let's say, both political system, like we, the society, not you and I, mm -hmm. but speaking historically about yeah, communism and capitalism or now like this neoliberal very much uh, systems, that there is like more material to really like do something new and maybe like present it from a different point of view, not like replicate what was done in the West, but kind of create your own way. But this is very interesting you say this because this is also a point in the uh, queer activism in East in Eastern parts of Europe because they always get like this assault that they are imitating the West. For example, with the Pride, with the Pride marches, you know, one of the biggest thing that right-wing political parties in Eastern Europe are claiming against queer people is that those prides are like this Verwestlichung, this Western Westernizing of Eastern culture. And they are doing this. This, yeah, shit. Yeah. this is super interesting. Yeah, this is super interesting that yeah, they are doing this. But on the other hand, yes, there should be new ways, but we still have to remember that even like this history of the prides, yeah, of this pride marches, of this queer liberation is super young like we have i i'm i always forgetting when the first march started it, it wasn't i think it was in the 70s or 80s or something i'm I'm not that sure but it's not old you know this is like super young and uh, and the queer movement is still learning you know now we are look look at where we are now standing we are talking more about trans perspectives about non-binary perspectives when i grew up you know and i'm born 1993 you know until recent until like five, six years ago, I didn't know those terms, you know. So we are mm. still learning. And that is the difficulty when in maybe in some Eastern parts, and they, of course, they have these perspectives as well, you know. But I think that at some points, they're at a different point than we are, for example, in Germany. Like here we have debates about pronouns, about um, about identity things. And in Poland and Russia or other countries, they are like still fighting about pure existence. That's the difference, you know. Yeah. That's kind of the privilege we are in here. No, yeah, in of part course. in Germany. Yeah, yeah. I think you, in one of your uh, episodes, you were speaking also about your experiences taking part in the Pride, how it was here in Berlin, and I think I don't know in which city you went in Poland to the Pride, that uh, you felt like a way stronger urgency, but it came also with, with danger, right? So mm. that's of course the yeah, what you're speaking about. That yes, it was, a, it was a demonstration in Poland. It, wa it wasn't even it wasn't a Pride. A pride. It, okay, it, was it was a demonstration, demonstration yeah, against the arrest of, I think her name was Ma Margo, was the, was Margo, the activist. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was very that was very eye opening. Mm, but was, of course, there are just like for people who are listening. There is also prides happening in yes, Poland. Yes, they are, and they are, I think, different. But also very. I was uh, in one in rec recent one in Warsaw, and it's also a very happy and colorful event. And it's different. It comes from a different perspective, you know. And of course, when especially when Polish queers, you know, are looking across the border here in Germany and Berlin is like the nearest city, of course they're seeing like differences. That's natural, you know, like how many, I, I even met um, po Polish Polish queer, queers, which I were visiting, visiting Berlin just for a weekend to feel a bit more, you know, free and more liberated or something. I don't know. It's happening, but, and that's important to say, there are happy, things are happening in Poland. Queer, queer activism is happening there. And those are super interesting and strong strong groups and i think alone from our from our background we know that polish people they are they are resilient you know and they will get through this i know this 
it's it will be hard because I don't think that it's the end um, for them, but they will get through it. And as much as we can support, we support them. How are you um, finding out about those actions and those people? Uh, you already mentioned the replica. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's great. I will definitely include it uh, in the show notes. But yeah, any other uh, suggestions of what people should and can check out or like how to find those channels? Oh my God, it's all social media. It sounds so so simple, but it's all social media because you can't trust media. <laughs> you can't trust like, you know, ordinary media anymore, some, especially in Poland because they're mixing things up. Yeah, it's you know. taken over kind of. Yeah, by, yeah, by absolutely. And national TV is a horror there. Like... When I was I was visiting my grandma a few weeks ago when I was listening to Polish news, I could like grab the TV and <laughs> yeah, throw yeah, it out yeah. of the it's 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 insane. But yeah, social media, there is the Grupa Stonewall, a stone I think it's called that's the Polish group and the international group is called um uh P Stonewall Poland or something. We can check it after. Mm -hmm. Um, Barstaszewski, for example, as well. And uh, I really have to dive into it. I, f I follow a few people there and a few accounts. I, 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 I follow uh, those, um, also like all those pride teams, you know, from various cities, which is super interesting because you see their work and, and how they are progressing and everything. And that's how I kind of keep myself up to date, what is happening. And I'm always a shout out to Replica because they're doing amazing work. It's so interesting to, to, to read it. It's a very vital, a vital magazine. Um, all like, you know, self-produced, self-published and everything. So this is my main go-to, I think. Yeah, I would say. And it's super interesting just to, to know that there are queer people who are fighting for other queers there. And uh, yeah, part of podcasting, studying, uh, you are also working with film. Yes. That's uh, kind of your professional like life. You're a f full time worker as well. And uh, you told me uh, briefly that you also uh, work in various uh, film festivals and also specific queer post host festivals. Yeah, I would like to uh, kind of round up on those uh, festivals. I'm curious about uh, yeah those events. And <clears throat> the festivals, I mean, I also work like for kind of big festivals um, internationally doing social media campaigns and press campaigns for, for various films, for example. I'm starting to now to get more into this queer festivals, which is kind of amazing. It was kind of a goal for me to dive more into this. But of course, it's small. You know, the b budgets are small. You can't just focus professionally on them because uh, it's not possible at a time I now. work this year uh, for for another time with the Exposed Queer Film Festival, which is not geographically orientated. It's more experimental and feature-based. Also documentaries are, are going there, which is kind of super nice. How are the Eastern European perspectives? There are films from Eastern Europe, yeah. but it's not a focus. That's, that's yeah, for yeah, example, yeah. it. Yeah, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. but, um, but is it, let's say, well-balanced, like the, uh, the regional stuff? I think it always depends on the festival because, for example, Exposed didn't do like a focus program because many festivals do this, like this geographical focus for one year and then shifting to another geographical focus. Um, but Exposed just, maybe not on purpose, but just because the films were amazing, invited films from from Eastern Europe. There was this super nice, I, of course, I forgot the name, a super nice short film from Russia, which portrayed it, uh, the story of, of a former boxer who was outed by his team. And it was super intimated shot because you didn't see his face. And um, of course, you can talk about now negative narrators from the East Eastern point of view, but it was a super artsy and super nice film. I was working with the Lithuanian Film Festival for the first time this year. Nice, yeah. They had a summer edition, which was a gay film, which was also very popular here in Berlin. It was called The Lawyer. For the main festival, there was no focus on queerness anymore, but uh, I really liked the aspect that it was all L Lithuanian films because you don't see them in any context. And it's actually the only film festival outside of Lithuania where you can see Lithuanian films, which is super interesting. And I was also working with the Zura Film Fest this year, which does North African and East West Asian, I think, perspectives, which is also not post us, but, but has a geographical focus on it. And I am planning to do, I was also in talks about it with a person, to do actually like a queer Eastern, Eastern Europe film uh, festival. Maybe not festival Yourself. because yeah, Organize by it. myself. Maybe not a whole festival, maybe like film reihe, like a few films, you know, to show this is something I would really like to work on in the future. And I hope it will work. But there is 
a brand new collective, which was just found here uh, in Berlin in November, which is called Quino with a Q. And they are trying to shift the focus to a non-Western cin cinema experience. And I think they will also like include queer perspectives there. And a friend of mine is also running it. So um, I'm very curious about it. Hopefully there will be chances to see more queer films from Eastern Europe because they are very interesting. They are super, super nice. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I love that uh, in Berlin there's so much happening. Yes. Especially with the focus on the, yeah, the post host I, I constantly discover new exciting people who I want to interview. Yes, really. <laughs> it's it's, it's nice. really nice because Berlin, uh, I mean, we have to go East Film Festival, which is not in Berlin. It's um, in Wiesbaden, I guess, uh, which is more in the southwest of Germany. And I, I don't know about uh, the number of queer films they're doing, but they have just Eastern films. So this is also a very nice, nice example. And it's kind of nice to have a festival outside of Berlin, to be honest, because we have, you know, many festivals are focused here in Berlin because it's we have the space, mm. but it's good to have also festivals outside of the capital. Always. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, um, I see film as such a strong element for political work, if you want to, you know, just to shift perspectives, to get to know people to get to know their lives and especially we are talking about festivals which, which are so, showing like low budget and very and private films you know which are dealing with topics you normally don't see in mainstream and that's kind of interesting mm. and lucky enough it happened that i work in those in this field and great really lucky nice. you i yeah. think <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think uh, we are almost uh, at the end. We we spoke quite quite some time. For the end, I would like to ask you for your favorite uh, home food, wherever home is, or like the the nostalgic taste of home. Oh my god! <laughs> Always a surprise to my speaker. <laughs> this question. Uh, and I even read it at the pitch, but uh, I haven't thought about it. Oh, that could be. You know what? Because we are. Getting near to Christmas, I would say to the holidays, whatever you're celebrating. My family is celebrating Christmas. We we have like this one soup. I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but it's uh, but it's like a cannabis soup we have at Christmas. Um, well done. It's a very a quite intense process to do it. You don't get high from it, so it's all clear. Um, <laughs> and that's a, a one year thing we have, like uh, an annual thing on Christmas we have, and it's more sweet with raisins as well and some nuts in it. How, how do you? What's the name of it? Um, in Polish, it's Szemiotka. Wow, I never heard of it. And this is also very interesting because in Silesia, just a small part of Silesian people are noticed. Like the family from my mother do not know it, but my, my father families are doing this. This Amazing. is very, a very specific Silesian dish for Christmas. And just because we're near the holidays, I would say that this is kind of one of my favorite foods there. I, I, I love Polish food, so basically I could <laughs> nice. name many things. Yeah. Are you celebrating here or are you going also to your family in Poland? I'm, uh, I'm going to my parents, which are living um, in Germany. Yeah, so I'm going to the southwest of Germany to, to visit them. And this year we'll be here, yeah, in Germany. Thank you so much, Kai, for uh, being my guest today. And yeah, for sharing uh, all those things. I'm, I'm very, very happy that finally we, we also met and, and recorded. Yes, yeah. thank you for the invitation. Thanks for your generosity. <laughs> was it for today. Thank you for reaching till the end of this episode. I will see you next time with another great artist and speaker. And as mentioned at the beginning, you can support this podcast via Patreon on patreon.com slash kitchen conversations. Or alternatively, you can also help me develop this platform by making a one-time donation, following my Instagram account, or leaving a comment on one of the podcast players. All of the needed links are placed in the show notes of this episode. Take good care, until next time!